Welcome to this virtual public health conference hosted by St. George's University. I am Satish Videsi, and together with the colleagues and students who you will meet along the way, we are excited to share in this experience with all of you. From our speakers of different places and places, and experiences, and our global participants. We will engage sessions over the next two days, ranging from presentations to panel discussions, virtual field trips, career mentoring, as we embrace relevance, creativity, and innovation as a theme for this conference, and indeed in necessity in the world in which we live in today. By way of a reminder, please utilize the full capacity of the conference website and app where you can access all details and re resources for the conference, as well as connect with our conference community. All sessions for this conference will be recorded and made available for you to access within 24 hours. If any of you, as part of your participation, would like to receive continuing education credits for this conference, there is a registration form which you can access on the conference website and the app. And if you have any queries, concerns, need for support technically, you can also access support from the app and email the conference secretariat, phconference at sgu.edu. Finally, we encourage you to disable your microphone and your video. However, you can actively participate with your questions, your feedback using the chat facility in the lower panel on your screen. We will certainly ensure that our conference presenters are kept on the P's and Q's with your Q's and E's. As we begin, we want you to feel welcome. Welcome to our conference hosted by St. George's University. And we have with us leaders from St. George's University who will bring welcome greetings and opening remarks, including Chairperson for Public Health and Preventive Medicine, our University Provost, and the President. So I'd like to first of all invite the Chairperson for Public Health and Preventive Medicine, Dr. Christy Richards, for her welcome and opening. Dr. Richards. Thank you, Dr. Badesi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, good day to everyone. Wherever you are, whatever the time is, wherever you're at, welcome from the beautiful Caribbean island of Grenada, where St. George's University is located, and from where I am currently bringing this welcome or extending this welcome. On behalf of the faculty and staff of St. George's University's Department of Public Health and Preventive Medicine, I extend a warm and hearty welcome to all of you to our special guests and presenters, university administrators, Dr. Richard Oles, Dr. Glenn Jacobs, Dr. Marius Lucas, and Dr. Callum McPherson. Our keynote speakers, Dr. Ulieta Rodriguez Guzman and Dr. Joyce St. John. Governmental representative, the permanent secretary from the Ministry of Health in Grenada, Dr. Francis Martin the representatives from the Pan-American Health Organization and the World Health Organization, our alumni, panelists, students, and to everyone who is joining us from all around the globe. Welcome, we're really pleased to have you. We are pleased to host St. George's University's Department of Public Health and Preventive Medicine's first ever global public health conference. At a time when public health has gained prominence due to the COVID-19 pandemic, when age old problems such as social injustices and health inequities have been highlighted, we felt that it was really an opportune time to host a conference that focused on these critical issues especially as the Caribbean region has been relatively successful managing the pandemic. Additionally, as an international institution, 
we are strategically positioned to provide local, regional, and international participants with an opportunity to share their experiences, their successes, and their strategies for moving forward. Thus, the theme of this conference, relevance, creativity, and innovation in public health education and practice with a focus on the COVID-19 pandemic, social justice, and equity. Now, SGU hosts an accredited online graduate public health program, and through collaboration with local and global partners, provides a teaching, research, and service experience with faculty and for students around the world. Our vision is to be a dynamic, local, regional, and global center of excellence in public health. This we accomplish by providing students with the opportunity to specialize in epidemiology, health policy and administration, global health, environmental and occupational health, as well as preventive medicine and veterinary public health as dual degrees with medicine and veterinary medicine. Through expert instruction from diverse faculty, active engagement, practical demonstration, and global internship experiences, our students and then our, our alumni are contributing as physicians, as epidemiologists, nurses, researchers, and policymakers. They have assumed leadership roles as healthcare administrators, as well as providers, and we are particularly we particularly want to extend our sincerest gratitude to all of them for their service, especially during these extraordinary times of this pandemic that we live in. We are assured that you will find this information useful and applicable to your own local and professional context. You also have the opportunity to earn continuing medical education credits. You can look forward to an informative and exciting conference with a true diverse and vibrant Caribbean flair. Welcome again and thank you for all of your participation. I will now hand you over to Dr. Glenn Jacobs, the Provost of the University, to continue our welcome to you all. Dr. Jacobs has been with the University and has provided support for the program since it was established in 1999. Thank you again, welcome, Dr. Jacobs. Good day, and once again, thank you, Dr. Richards. I would like to welcome all of you to this virtual conference today. A special word of welcome to our keynote speakers and representatives from the government of Grenada. The conference theme, relevance, creativity, and innovation in public health education and practice is very relevant to what is happening in the world today. We have all been affected by the global COVID-19 pandemic. Over the next two days, you will hear more about how to prevent the disease, promote health, how our new normal has forced us to be more creative about work and how we live and learn as well as how we have transformed goals into opportunities. The Department of Public Health and Preventive Medicine was established in 1999. We have graduated more than 1,100 students. Our current student enrollment is approximately 430. The Department of Health and Preventive Medicine plays a big role in the community of Grenada and globally, and it's an important part of our university. Now we have more than 850 conference registrations today from across the world. And again, a very special word of welcome to all of you. We appreciate you attending and trust that this will be a great learning experience for all of you. We also have approximately 280 students participating. And to all of you, thank you. <clears throat> so, Dr. Richards, congratulations to you and your team for um, putting this event together. 
Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Richard Olds, our president of St. George's University. But before doing so, let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. Olds. So Dr. Olds is an educator, a physician, a father, a grandfather, administrator. Um, and he became president of St. George's University in Grenada, West Indies on August 28, uh, 2015. Now, prior joining to uh, joining St. George's University, he was the vice chancellor for health affairs and founding dean of the School of Medicine at the University of California, Riverside. Dr. Olds is a graduate of Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and trained in internal medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. He was an infectious disease fellow and one of the nation's first geographic medicine fellows at University Hospitals of Cleveland, where he also served as medical chief resident and faculty member. He served as full professor of medicine, pediatrics, molecular cell and development biology at Brown University. In addition to his academic background, Dr. Olds is a tropical disease specialist with extensive experience working in Asia and Africa. He has over 100 peer reviewed articles and book chapters primarily on international health topics. Dr. Olds, we're very pleased that you are able to join us today and we're all looking forward to your presentation. Once again, welcome to all of you. Have a great day and thank you, Dr. Olds. Well, thank you, Glenn, and thank you, Dr. Richards. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome you again, the participants in the conference, my fellow speakers, uh, representatives of the Grenadian government. Uh, in addition to obviously my administrative backgrounds, interestingly, I'm also a faculty member uh, and I have taught for 40 years at all of my institutions, largely on diseases uh, that make the transition from animals to uh, humans, so-called uh, uh, zoonotic diseases. So uh, it's uh, particularly relevant today uh, since uh, we're facing probably the world's greatest uh, pandemic in uh, almost in over a century. And so in addition to welcoming, I wanted to make some brief comments about COVID-19, which could be the most, clearly the most relevant uh, to careers in public health of any event that has uh, uh, occurred in certainly my lifetime. Can I have the first slide? <clears throat> this is a map actually from the World Health Organization, uh, thanks to them. This is right off their website. I could have picked any number of things to look at. This happens to be the deaths in the last 24 hours, uh, as was determined just a few days ago. And as you can see, this is clearly a worldwide pandemic. And as you can also see, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Now you can't see that clearly in this map, but there's a small number of countries, including Grenada, that have managed to uh, uh, basically hold their own with this virus uh, over uh, uh, the last almost year. But the vast majority of countries have obviously, especially as the colder climates have uh, come to the Northern hemisphere, have uh, been uh, losing ground against this virus. Could I have the next slide? Sort of in summary, <clears throat> overall, I think it would be fair to say that the COVID-19 situation is getting worse, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. And only a few nations, interestingly, almost all island nations like Grenada, have managed to really keep COVID-19 under control. Now, there's a lot of things that have contributed to that, including quarantine fatigue and colder weather. And it's caused a second wave of uh, infection in many countries, including a lot of Europe. But the US, unfortunately, really has never gotten COVID-19 under control. Fortunately, we know a lot more about the virus today than we did in the beginning. Uh, public health workers and researchers in science and veterinary medicine have been working vigorously in this field. And uh, I think we're in a much better position today to combat the disease than we were a year ago. But we need to be able to change people's current behavior and we need to convince politicians what are the right things to do to control this virus. Next slide. <clears throat> well, among the things that are important to point out about this virus is that everyone can get infected. 
And uh, not everyone has the same likelihood of being hospitalized and dying, but there was a thought at the beginning of this pandemic that young people didn't have to worry about this particular disease. That is clearly not true. Uh, and in fact, if you look at uh, significant excess mortality and morbidity during the last year, younger people between 25 and 50 have actually suffered a significant amount of excess morbidity and mortality. Now, social justice has also been an important part of this particular uh, pandemic. Poor people, people of color, people with underlying medical conditions, the elderly are all at risk of dying should they get uh, COVID-19 at higher numbers than the general population, making social justice a very important part of this particular pandemic. Now, a lot of transmission comes from people without symptoms. And this is probably largely responsible for why we've had such great difficulty controlling the virus so far. And uh, we initially thought that we could uh, control this from a public health standpoint by screening for fever and symptoms. But clearly, since over 40% of the transmission takes place from people that have no symptoms, we've had a hard time combating the thought that people have that they ignore good public health measures because, quote, they feel fine. Clearly, people that feel fine and have no symptoms are important vectors for the transmission of this disease. Now, again, as we think about uh, um, what we can do, at the very beginning, there wasn't a nearly as much enthusiasm about mask wearing, <clears throat> and that was largely because uh, masks and other viral diseases were not particularly effective in protecting individuals from getting infected. But we now know that mask wearing is very important. Some countries, in fact, have been able to control the COVID-19 pandemic primarily through universal mask wearing and social distancing. Unfortunately, in some countries, including the United States, mask wearing has now become a political issue, making this a much greater challenge for public health professionals. And finally, new public health insights, which we have gained over the last year, are hard to disseminate when we have cries of fake news and conspiracy theories clouding basically the truth about what we all have to do to control this pandemic. Next slide. Now, most people, including many physicians, actually don't understand some of the limitations of the current tests done by COVID-19. And this has led to some problems from a transmission and public health standpoint. So I'm gonna spend just a, a few minutes uh, outlining those tests and pointing out their strengths and weaknesses. And this is very important because good public health measures require data and we need to know what kind of data we need. Now, antibody tests are basically measuring the, your body's response to being infected with, in this case, the virus. And then, uh, although those may be useful from an epidemiologic standpoint to find out how many people in the population have actually already been infected, they're not very uh, effective in finding individual cases or managing individual cases because it probably takes eight to 10 days after people develop symptoms for a good IgG antibody response to develop. So clearly antibody testing is primarily useful from an epidemiologic standpoint. Now, the new tests <clears throat> and the one for which I think there's the most confusion are antigen tests. These actually measure the proteins on the viral particles themselves. And antigen testing has uh, been an important part of measuring and following a whole variety of other infectious diseases. The advantage of antigen testing is they are very fast, often point of service tests and uh, they're relatively simple to perform from a cost standpoint. The drawback is they're not very sensitive and very specific, and that is, uh, creates great difficulty. So for instance, the current antigen tests in COVID-19 have a 30% false negative rate. That's a lot of patients that are missed that are infected, but in fact test negative. Now, probably the greatest example of that failure uh, is the White House in the United States, where they thought that by testing everyone with antigen testing every day, they didn't have to have good public health measures like mask wearing and social distancing. And we all see how that worked out. We had obviously outbreaks uh, within potentially the most protected population in the United States because of the failure of those antigen tests 
to identify infected people <clears throat> at, the, you know, at the onset of infection. The second problem with antigen tests is they can have false positives. And as you may recall, if you follow the news, this happened to the governor of Ohio who went to the White House, tested positive with an antigen test, was quarantined and went back to the state of Ohio and had multiple more sensitive PCR tests and turned out that was a false positive test. Now the gold standard in this uh, disease are PCR or polymerase chain reaction tests. Those actually look for the actual nucleic acids in the virus and they have an amplification step. That means they are very sensitive. <clears throat> they can often find very small numbers of viral particles. And so they are turned positive faster in the natural course of the illness. They are more specific and they are far more sensitive. And so really PCR testing is really uh, now the test that we really need to do to control this pandemic. But let me also point out that PCR tests do also have occasions where they have false negatives, probably in the uh, you know, eight to 10% range. So they're not infallible, but they're considerably better than antigen tests. Now, the other new thing that we've discovered <clears throat> is that we used to think that all the viral particles were in heavy lipid droplets that fall, fell out of the air within six feet. That's where a lot of that you know, six feet uh, uh, descriptions were. In fact, they fell out of the air often within three feet. Unfortunately, we now know that about 10 to 15% of the viral particles are actually transmitted through very small lipid droplets and they stay in the air much longer. And this has now changed our thinking fairly recently about recommendations about things like indoor dining and indoor bars because uh, that social spacing is less secure and those are all settings for which people remove their masks. Now we also have a new understanding <clears throat> about if you will, the spread of this disease. You know, at the beginning, we used to think that all infected people were sort of equally infectious and this turns out not to be the case. About 20% of the infected people are responsible for about 80% of the transmission, so-called super spreaders. Now we saw the same uh, behavior uh, in SARS where a small number of people actually were responsible for a lot of the transmission. But this has also changed our recommendations about large groups because the larger the group of individuals that you're in, the more likely it is that there's a super spreader in that group among those that are infected. So those are two new insights that we didn't really have several months ago. Now, even if we had a safe and effective vaccine right now, there are our problems are not over, if you will. Even if we had a safe and effective vaccine right now, we would still have to maintain good public health practices like mask wearing and social distancing for some time as we attempt to vaccinate large percentages of the population. So it's not like as soon as there's a vaccine, we can abandon all of the public health measures. No, those will continue for some time, potentially for a very long period of time. Next slide. Well, there are some good news on the horizon. <clears throat> Science has been actively working in this area. We're doing a much better job of saving lives of infected people now with COVID-19. Uh, we now know how to position them. We now know not to put them all on respirators right away. Uh, we also know that we can anticoagulate them. We can uh, uh, do a lot of other things. So the mortality rate for people who have actually become infected with COVID-19 has dropped by almost 50%, a tremendous improvement in the management of those cases largely through uh, supportive therapy. We know that monoclonal antibodies are almost here. Uh, they're in, uh, in experimental use now. And a lot of science is working very actively on more specific virally targeted treatments, but those will be coming down the pike, but they're not all here yet. There are a lot of vaccines under development. We should know by Christmas whether these are actually going to work and are safe, but it's going to take a while to ramp up uh, any of these vaccines that look like they may be efficacious. And I don't personally believe that we will have any wide scale deployment, even if we find an effective vaccine until summer. But let's also point out, since this is a public health conference, we can control a lot of the transmission if we can only get everyone to follow the guidelines. Next slide. Well, there is some bad news in the, in the horizon. We know that natural infection, we don't know if natural infection uh, induces immunity. We hope it does. And if it does, we don't know how long it'll last. 
Uh, humans do develop natural immunity against human uh, coronaviruses, but in general, it lasts less than a year. We now know some patients uh, left with chronic symptoms, and uh, this is concerning. So people that uh, still recover from COVID-19 can still be left with a chronic cough and other chronic symptoms. Almost half the people uh, uh, that survive in the United States say that they wouldn't take a safe and effective vaccine if available. So we're gonna have an important public health challenge to convince people once a safe and effective vaccine is available that we need large segments of the population to become vaccinated. Now the worldwide supply chain uh, of essential equipment and supplies has not been completely fixed. And with the current new wave of uh, infection, we're, our supply chain is again gonna be heavily stressed. And we also need to deal from a social equity standpoint and who's going to pay for what all people in the world are going to need from a treatment and therapy standpoint. We can't allow it to happen that only rich people in wealthy countries get the best treatment that we have. Next slide. So in summary, I think things unfortunately are going to get worse before they get better, but I do think they ultimately will get better. Trust in public health and science, I think given time, we will find the answers to help us control this pandemic. We need WHO as they have always been to be the trustworthy source of up-to-date information about COVID-19 and we need the politicians to listen to them. And finally, our world has never needed public health professionals more than they do today, and particularly appropriate in the conference that we're hosting today. Last slide. So it is my, uh, my honor to uh, open this uh, conference, uh, virtual public health conference on the relevance, creativity and innovation in public health education and practice. I look forward to an exciting two days. Uh, thank you. Thank you.